programming for what has been an extraordinarily full two and a half days. Uh, over dinner last night, we were saying, now, that thing that happened yesterday, and then realizing, no, it actually had happened that morning. But y yesterday really was a 10 out of 12. And we, we went through an, an immense amount of content, and we started with really good content on Wednesday afternoon when we first began. Throughout this, we've, we've had a variety of moments to speak publicly, but I am absolutely certain that there are things that have not yet been said that need to be said here at this confluence of the rivers of audience engagement and community development. Uh, and, you know, just in the brief conversations that I've had with people when I haven't been logisticating with the amazing staff, what I've come to see is that there are, there are complexities and nuances about the work that we're doing to engage our audiences, to build our, our communities, that need to be aired out among us. And that's what this space is for. So as with everything else we've done, we're going to try and keep a time frame on any public speaking that you want to do so that we don't privilege people who, well, like me, are able to speak in paragraphs strung together and could do so for 10 minutes at a time, but really who needs to hear me for more than 90 seconds. Uh, when I'm not giving you instructions about buses, that is. Um, so I'm, I'm going to open the call on the floor. We've got these two standing mics. And I'm going to encourage you to say what has not yet been said. And to say what has not yet been said around balancing audiences, new audiences, and existing subscribers is the place that I'd like to start, because that's where Lynn Carruthers is standing. And she's going to capture some of the brilliant ideas that you have about this. Recognizing that we had some content reporting in your cohorts, which was fabulous, we'd like to encourage, is there more to say? Is there more that you're still struggling with? Are there nuances of these conversations that came up over the time that you were working on this together? Or pieces out of the small group breakouts that really deserve to be heard by everybody that hasn't been heard on Twitter. Dale, are you, are you gesturing toward us? Would you, would you be so kind as to approach Devin, who will meet you in the middle? Because we, we believe in meeting people close to where they are, but not actually where they are. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can hear me. Yeah. yeah, and please tell us who you are, even though I Hi, just I'm called Dale your name. I'm Dale Smith. And what I'd, I'd mentioned it, uh, I guess, yesterday or day before, what I would have liked to hear, heard, because I was, I was invited to come to TCG as a, uh, so, not solo, but as a playwright and as a performer, how playwrights and performers felt, feel about their individual participation within theater in, term, in reference to groups. I think I want to curse so bad because it's annoying. <laughs> because I can hear myself, you know. It's just, but, but in reference to their, their uh, experiences, in reference to groups, in terms of their individual voice, how it gets heard, how it gets lost, in terms of, for lack of a better term, politicking, yeah? Mm. Do I make any sense? You do. I would love to hear your experience with that. Well, I, I, I think I said it the other day where sometimes certain things that I've written, um, this doesn't rep this, this doesn't rep that. So on the one hand, it's about trying to get group, uh, how do you call it? We, you, certainly we, we need support. But on the other hand, you've got the individual voice of the artist, which may not coincide with a group, but still needs to be heard. Because the role of theater, I think, we're certainly supposed to entertain. We're supposed to also supposed to educate. And um, Elizabeth Ashley said it best. She said the theater is supposed to be a dangerous place. Mm. Where's the danger? Mm -hmm. Dale, in the wild card breakout yesterday, you, you told a story. What story? <laughs> the story about um, how am I supposed to sell rock and roll from you? That story. Can you just tell that real quickly? OK, well, very briefly. This new solo that I'm doing is called Forever. New York Theater Workshop is going to do it, and, and it was done at um, it was done at uh, Kirk Douglas in L.A. We were at um, I just left the Long Wharf, and now it's going there. And it also goes to uh, Portland Center Stage. I guess I mean a lot of us write outside the box, or we'd like to think we do, or some of us don't. And I'm a, a tremendous rock and roll fan, and so this piece starts and ends at Jim Morrison's grave in Père Lachaise Cemetery. And as a young person, and, and even now as a middle-aged woman, I still listen to a lot of rock and roll. And the theater, the, the theater is not here, and it's not right for me to just call them out like that. One of the th 
places that I sent this uh, script to, I was told, I love this script, but I don't know how to sell a black woman listening to rock and roll to a black audience. There's the story. And also they said, you know, uh, and they also said, you know, white people would be fascinated by this. And I said, I guess, I said, I can't even wrap my head around that kind of pretzel logic. Because that's exactly what the hell it is. <laughs> Are, if, are you are you pointing to who should be our next well, he speaker? Said, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> Greg, you know? So this is what I'm saying, that kind of compartmentalized yeah. thinking. And then what I would have liked to hear heard while here, and maybe it's another time, yeah? Right. The other you know, other people who are working, you know, the working artists, they're you know, how do they feel uh paral not paralyzed, but are they I in other words, I've seen people like change their work because it didn't fit a quote unquote group ethic. I've seen that happen many times, and I would have loved to hear some more about that here. So, and I've had the mic enough. Yeah, Somebody you're good. You're good. So Annabelle's got somebody's waving hands over here. And she's finding them. Here we go. Yep. Oh, me? Yes. Okay. And tell us who you are, please. Yep. Christine Bruno, Inclusion in the Arts. Um, sorry to be a broken record, but I'm going to bounce off what Dale just said, and I would... Um, I've heard so many great stories and so many enthusiastic um, representatives for increased diversity in everyone's theater. I would just encourage people to make sure that you don't compartmentalize by, by like what Dale just said. If you, if you want to do uh, a play that you would cons that your uh, subscribers or audience base would be you know, would consider diverse. Don't think that by doing that one play that you've that you've done your due diligence. Try to just expand your your thinking and expand your programming to not even think necessarily. Um, I've heard it said a lot today that diversity is d d different things to different people. I, I'm a I have trouble with that <laughs> only because I think. Diversity is all things. Everything we think is diverse should be considered diversity. Diversity should be all inclusive. So we shouldn't say, oh, your idea of diversity doesn't jive with my idea of diversity, or my theater's idea of diversity is different. We all have you know, things that we are more concerned with than, than other things, but try to look at diversity as all inclusive, including your programming. And I just encourage everybody to not put diversity in the box. Brilliant, thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Great, so we're going over here. Let us know who you are. Hi, I'm Sarah Madden from the Wilma Theater. Uh, this, this conference has been really great and I think one of the things I've been thinking about a lot is the age of our audience. Mm. Um, so our existing subscribers, our, they, they're on the older end, not old, but on the older end, uh, <laughs> 50 plus. <laughs> And our newer audience, uh, they're in their 20s, and um, they're not really getting along. Um, and I would love to hear ideas, you know, offline or whatever, um, about how to get them talking to each other and mentoring each other and seeing our theater through each other's eyes. Fabulous. Yes, at our last Audience Revolution convening, was it Gabe Zitzelman? who offered the uh, notion that many of our subscription audiences are somewhere between 65 and cremated. <laughs> so we're working on changing that demographic. All right, I want to move down the topic line. Yes, ma'am. Oh, before you know, I move down the topic. this was not on that topic, because it was riffing off of other things people were riff, saying. Riff okay. on. Um, Tell us who you are. I am Madeline Sayet uh, from Amarinda. Uh, so, sorry, just driving off of a couple things other people said. I just wanted to draw attention uh, to something in terms of the way the word diversity is being used is I think that the problem is is that it's being, it is being used as a way to facilitate checking boxes as opposed to a way to facilitate inclusion. Because mm. actually, when I came here with a mind for authentic partnerships with diverse audiences, what I meant was non-native audiences. Mm. So it, it actually, a lot of like the things that came up weren't as useful because I actually was looking at including, you know, white audiences. Um, and everyone was assuming that the only thing we were looking at was checking boxes. 
Um, and that's super problematic and ultimately doesn't put us all in the same conversation, um, which is, I think, what we were shooting for. And that I think a really great concept that came up in a question mark session uh, was this idea of new ways of listening. Um, and that was something that was really exciting because it was a small room of us, and so we just listened, and we sat, and we, we had a great moment to talk about new ways of listening um, to our communities in a way to try and uh, detach ourselves from some of the lenses we bring to the conversations. And I think that that is something that is, I think, getting forgotten in the way that we actually build our partnerships out of respect as opposed to facilitating a need we have to get grants. Well said. The trouble with the dominant culture is it dominates. So we've got Rachel on the queue and then two others over here. So Annabelle, if you will shift over that way. Go, Rachel, go. Uh, so this is riffing, I think, off of some of these things. And this is probably not as well thought. But um, the ar in Article 1, I can't believe I'm doing it. In Article 1 of UNESCO's Universal Declaration on Cultural Diversity in 2001, there's this great quote. I think, uh, as a source of exchange, innovation, and creativity, cultural diversity is as necessary for humankind as biodiversity is for nature. Um, and I find, I have found it extremely problematic that we have not been addressing power dynamics and privilege um, in this gathering. Um, this is not at all a, s a slight to TCG because I think if this has been fabulous and you know I love you because I try to tell you all the time. Um, but I sense that there's a real divide in this room and there's a real divide between language that's being used and I don't mean there's like one group and another group. I think there's multiple groups within this. Um, and I'm having a lot of personal struggle with that and I'm finding a lot of, and I'm, and I'm seeing a lot of nods and I'm hearing people talk about that and I've connected with some people individually about that. I think there's a group of us that are completely um, unaware of this um, and I think there are some of us that understand it in a way that others of us don't. Um, and, uh, and honestly, I'm like really kind of fucking sick of the people that are unaware of it because it's really not that hard to start dealing with some of this work. Um, I, I run a quarter of a million dollar operation. We're now a quarter of a million dollar. Three years ago, we were $50,000. And we just started working on it because we said it was important. And that was the audience we wanted to be working with. And I think it's OK if it's not the audience or the community that you want to be working with. Like, I really respect that it's not. Like, because that's. I want to go back, sorry, and I'm going to wrap up in a second. Because yeah. that's biodiversity and cultural diversity. But don't say that it is when it isn't. Boom, done. Um, yeah. In the, um, the wild card, the second wild card breakout yesterday, which was the one with the moonshine, um, our, <laughs> <laughs> our, our topic ended up being power and power dynamics. And so if you look at the other bucket, you will see some writing and some mapping around the discussion that we had there. But that was a small group discussion. Um, my experience of coming to TCG conferences for the last 24 years has been that there's a lot of unacknowledged power dynamics um, within the room. And that TCG has deliberately endeavored to shift those power dynamics. When I first came to my first TCG meeting in 1991, it was all Lort theaters and a couple of us felt like, maybe it wasn't, but it felt like a couple of us scrappy SPTs. The, the balance of the population of TCG, as I understand it, has shifted over that time. But we are still very much in that struggle. And it's a struggle that replicates the larger struggle in our culture right now. So I want to affirm what you were saying and affirm the fact that it is really troubling and really difficult to bring up. Thank you. OK, tell us who you are. Hi, I'm Catherine Kovner from the Playwrights Realm. And mm -hmm. I just wanted to riff on a few of the things that have been said. Um, I think in terms of diversity, I think that one of the impulses that have, has made us all think about this is the desire to mirror the society around us. And in my thinking about diversity, that's really the impulse that I'm starting to try to go back to. And I think if you think about it, 
that way. It's a very uh, holistic way and a little bit more intuitive than the checking the box approach, you know, that allows you to think about all of the categories at once and, and just think about are we representing the society that we see, you know, outside our door or however you define your community, you know, in your city, in your state, in your nation. And, you know, so that's, that's what I'm trying to do and, and I think it's an approach that, that I encourage. Mm -hmm. Can be a little challenging for those of us who live in places that are 97% white. So looking at, that, looking at those demographics and, yeah, nation. Nation. Nation, there you go. So right behind you, we got two. Pick one. Hi, everybody. Oh, wow. Yeah. You really can't hear yourself. Um, Let us know uh, who you are. I'm Elizabeth Nearing. I work at Long Wharf Theater. Um, and just off of the conversation we're having about diversity right now, something came up in the artistic breakout the other day that I just wanted to talk about intersectionality for a second. Yeah. And the fact that people aren't just boxes, right? And that, that's something that I think most people in this room, I hope, agree with. Um, and that you know, when we're talking about having women's voices, also having like a multiplicity of different kinds of women, women in power, women not in power. They can be strong or they can be not strong, that's okay. And that's the same for races, for genders, for all, for all things, that there are Absolutely. so many different mm -hmm. kinds of people that can be represented on our stages and in our stories and the way we talk about them that it's hard when we're saying, oh, do we have a, this kind of play? Do we have, and trying to push in season building, how do you, make all these different kinds of things a part of the conversation. Short, sweet, Thank and you. to the point. Brilliant. So let's pass the mic right over here. Yeah. Hey, I just wanted to um, but you go must back. tell us who you are. Oh, sorry. I'm time. Joy Meads. I live in LA. I work at Center Theater Group, um, and I'm a member of the Kilroy's. So I wanted to just talk about the revolution part of the audience Revolution, um, and to say that actually, I just think it's going to really help if we acknowledge the fact that what we're talking about in this room are some pretty radical shifts in um, in what we do, how we do it, and for whom. And you know, we've heard, I think, at the edges of the conversation, um, some pushback from you know people get hearing um, complaints, people getting secondhand uh, reports of. Um, accounts from their traditional stakeholders that uh, are, they're not entirely happy with everything that's happening. And I, just, I think it's actually important to be very frank about the fact that what we're talking about is a change for many institutions. I should be clear, not every institution, you know. Um, and that uh, I think if the more honest and frank we are about this change, the fact that it will represent a loss for some people who are very comfortable in the status quo, right? but that we believe that it is both necessary for our survival and the morally right thing for us to do as tax-supported organizations that um, are given uh, exemption from paying taxes because we work for the public good, right? That we really wanna serve our communities. So um, I think acknowledging that, acknowledging the loss will help us to make sure that these programs don't get circumscribed, contained, um, uh, pushed underground, you know, all of those things that you can see happening sometimes when there's a conflict of vision serving those people who have not traditionally been powerful stakeholders. Is there a story that you can tell us out of your own theater? I mean, you're one of the largest uh, theaters in the country. And it's most core values and work and engaging the community through that we need to be also protecting that work. The work of the artists at the core who are maybe training every day on a regular basis or undertaking deep research or spending long periods of time to write a script with great support. I think that that work cannot be, um, I just wanna make sure it's not forgotten um, because that's the work that forms the purpose and the core of the engagement, and whether that's with an amateur artist or a professional artist of any ethnicity or background or perspective, that for me is where the real juice is in the conversation. And I also think we need people like Pastor Mike to remind us of those core values, but being reminded is not enough. It's about doing the work, going into the rehearsal room, 
and practicing exactly what we're preaching. So, um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing many of you in Cleveland, Ohio for Game Change. Great, okay, so I think we're moving to Randy and then uh, if you'll, Randy, hand the mic off to Rebecca Novak, she was waving also. But who are you? I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm Randy Reyes, a Moo Performing Arts in the Twin Cities, an Asian American theater company uh, that does theater in Taiko for the last 23 years. Um, and I just wanted to, we talk a lot about uh, diversifying audiences and I just wanted to, just to remind or to um, just bring light to the fact that there are theaters of color doing sustainable work in these communities. You're here. And to please find equitable ways of working with that and really think about power dynamics as you are working with these groups. Please use us as a resource. We do want to work with you. We do want our best for our community, but it takes a different uh, a way of working that we have a shared power dynamic so that we're not appropriating our community, but lifting them up and giving them a voice. Well said, sir, well said. Great. So, Rebecca, hold on one second. We're gonna go all the way to the back of the room. Hello. Hi, my name is Kristen Schweitzer. I'm with the San Diego Repertory Theater and I am the partnerships manager. That's a title I made up because the question became, why us? Why should this African-American dance group come to our African-American play when we won't go to their work, mm. when we won't form that relationship? So we spent a year, or I spent a year, going to these places without flyers and just meeting them and just watching their art and not saying, okay, see you next time we have a black play. <laughs> Peace. Because it's not about getting as many of this minority into our door. It's about forming a lasting relationship where there is no, well, how do we exit softly? It's, well, now that you've trusted us with your history and your culture in this show, we're doing in a Latino show. I know you're not Latino, but would you like to come? Brilliant. Hi, I'm Rebecca Novick from California Shakespeare Theater, and I, I wanted to talk about the word revolution, too, mm -hmm. as, as Joy was. Um, thinking for me, uh, for my own organization, and I think for many here, just kind of looking at this desire that springs up uh, among some, some folks to, to see what we can change without actually changing. Like, like could we get you know, more racially diverse audiences without doing anything different, like not doing any different plays or casting actors of color or like changing out fields in our lobbies. And, and I, I think, I think um, if we are really talking about revolution, I'd love to see this space move away from kind of tips and tricks to look like we're changing but not really yeah. calling for change. And I, and I, I, I think that um, when we go that direction, then we have to talk about internal change. And I, I think um, I, I really want to say, so our, our organization has begun to um, often and publicly use the phrase historically white to describe ourselves. So we are a historically white audience with a historically mostly white, historically white theater with historically mostly white audience, by which I mean we're a Shakespeare theater with mostly white staff and a mostly white board and a mostly white audience. And for historically white theaters, the, the one of the critical steps of being part of this revolution, I think, is to, is to get your staff and then the circles beyond that working on what Rachel was talking about. We uh, are doing anti-racism training, thank you, Carmen, um, with our staff. We are beginning to broach that with our board and I think that that conversation needs to move more explicitly into this space as well. And many of you may be aware of the incredible debate sparked by East-West players um, in their provocation to use the Rooney Rule and to start to build staffs of theaters that actually genuinely, staffs and boards of theaters that actually genuinely reflect the demographics of the communities that we're serving, which in California would put you in what is called in demography terms a majority minority, but where, where Eurocentric work no longer dominates because Eurocentric people no longer dominate. Radical shift. Okay, uh, over here. Hi everyone, I'm Samantha Wire. I'm the Director of Education at Shakespeare Theater Company in DC. And uh, I just wanted to take a moment to remind everybody that 
you all, all of your organizations, wonderful organizations as you're grappling with this, have a very wonderful tool in your back pocket. And we are a group of people that have, as Liam Neeson says, a specific set of skills. Your education people have been listening to other groups, have been creating deep programs, have been working with people to have a relationship to the organization, not just on stage. And so I just want, as some of us um, in education have been talking, it's like, ask us. We have ideas. And I would encourage artistic directors, executive directors, um, this week, ask them to come in your office and just have a conversation about how do you think we could engage our community? Because I bet you they're going to have some ideas. Brilliant. Come on in the back, back here. There we go. First here, and then, then back here. Yeah. Um, uh, somebody talked about, uh, I don't know your name, but... Um, but please tell us who Sorry, was. Maria Elena. I'm from Adventure Stage Chicago. We're a theater for young audiences. We're part of a social service organization. Um, so we have the very odd situation of we are in a very... Um, in a neighborhood that has become very hipster and young and predominantly white. Um, but it is historically a very immigrant um, neighborhood, and it has been Polish and Ukrainian, and it is now, for the most part... Um, uh, Hispanic, uh, mostly Mexican, but also uh, Central American and uh, et cetera. I want to talk a little bit about the engagement part of, um, of an audience engagement and community engagement. And I think that, um, I mean, Donna Walker Kuhn is, is one of my heroes and she was a, a professor of mine and she's wonderful. And she wrote, you know, an invitation to the party. And I think that we assume oftentimes that w if we just invite people to the party, mm -hmm. they will come, right? And I think that we need to also think about um, what kind of party it is and where the party is, because for many um, communities, and I, you know, my family is um, historically Puerto Rican, I would say, because I grew up in Hannibal, Missouri, but, uh, but my extended <laughs> family um, did not grow up going to theater. It is not something that you do. Um, I lived in Mexico for a while, and so I know also that way that actually stepping through the doors of a theater is not something that the vast majority of the population accepts as a cultural right that they have. It, so I think when we think about engagement, we just assume that that means getting more people into our doors. And that may not be the case. It may be figuring out either where, what the programming is, and if you have tackled the programming, great, wonderful, and if you're wondering why they're still not coming, um, you know, it might be a price thing, but we have a lot of free programming and we still can't get the community to come. And it's a built-in audience that we have because of our social service organization. They're still not coming. And I, you know, I'm the only person with a historically hi Hispanic background in the office and I say, think about maybe taking the party to them. Because if you want them to engage with you, um, you know, like you were saying, it's not just about getting them in the door. Right. So we're going to go to Steve over here, and then the mic's going to move to the back of the room. I'm Steve Martin with um, Child's Play, and very interesting with Theater for Young Audiences um, are that we perform for schools. And so our audiences actually don't select, you know, uh, what they're going to see. And, and so, you know, when we look out into our audience, and, you know, I'll say probably 20 years ago, um, our organization started producing bilingual plays because we started looking into our audience and started realizing um, that it was changing dramatically and that 65% of our audience now, we believe, are um, Hispanic and that we have to put work on our stage that is authentic um, uh, to their experiences. And so we're actually trying to make sure that we keep up with our audiences mm. um, and their changing demographics and uh, how we represent their families on stage with uh, single parents, with um, multi-ethnic uh, families. Um, we're kind of wrestling right now with gay and lesbian um, families and how we represent those on stage so that when that young person sitting in that audience, they're, they're saying to themselves, I, I know those people. That's my family up there on stage. Um, I'm, I'm getting it and I'm understanding it. And so we were kind of pushed in another way um, uh, to diversity. Now internally, we're like failing miserably. Um, <coughs> on that, and we need to be more purposeful um, in our efforts uh, on that. And there was one more thing I wanted to say. 
and I can't remember what it was. Poof, so I'm done. You're done. <laughs> Great. Okay, back here. Tell us who you are. Sure. Hi, I'm Kathy Dodsvich. Uh, and uh, uh, I just two things. One is that, uh, you know, because yeah. I'm very passionate about the word diversity <laughs> um, uh, as an artist uh, and as an artivist. Uh, and so, so I just wanted to say that let us not forget aesthetic diversity in this conversation uh, because I think sometimes that gets, gets put somewhere else. Um, and uh, it is part and parcel of what we do. Uh, and, and I just want to remark on something about moving the field forward, which has to do with that the revolution has to do with that. And so it's ongoing, uh, to quote Pastor Mike from yesterday, ongoing. But, but I think that the question being that this, is, this isn't just the revolution convening now, but the revolution has been happening. <laughs> it's not like it just started today. Uh, and, that, and that maybe we're playing a bit of catch up, some of us, um, which is okay. Um, and also to just acknowledge um, that the furthering of a single institution is not the only goal, but the furthering of the field, which is why I'm just going to encourage you again that diversity be also aesthetic. Great. So I'm just going to give our mic runners a heads up. We've got time for two more, and it looks like there's one there and one there. Anybody else who's, who's dying to speak? And Faye Hargate, you're going to have the last word. Okay. Tell us okay. who you are. Um, so I'm Sarah. I'm the managing director at Company One Theater in Boston. And um, I, w I had this weird conversation with a couple of board members, um, or that struck me as weird. And uh, we have a um, very young audience. We have 55% of our audience is under 35. Um, and uh, we feel like we've done, you know, we've, we're 16 years old. We've done a lot of work. It's very mission driven that we have a very diverse audience in lots of different ways. And my, my board, a couple of board members were like, well, we need to focus on traditional audiences now because we need to um, increase our budget. We have all these goals, so that, that's what we have to start doing. And it kind of, I, I was really taken back and I've been thinking a lot about why all of a sudden this happened. And um, I think, uh, uh, so part of it, um, I think uh, Melissa Hillman kind of uh, touched on this in one of her um, blog posts. What is really is a kind of, uh, I want to make sure we're talking also about the philanthropic community. Mm. Um, a lot of the, uh, I'll speak locally anyway, a lot of the money um, that goes into some of this work that we talk about around engagement seems to really be about changing large organizations and not focusing on some of the smaller institutions that are seeing at least some success in, in what we're talking about. So I want to make sure that was kind of in the room too that were, you know, we ha I know we have some philanthropic voices in the room, but kind of that, that at least locally feels like a huge conversation that kind of is not really happening. So. Yeah. So there are two resources I want to offer on that. Um, one is an excellent study that Holly Sidford authored that pointed out that 55% of the money goes to 2% of the organizations in arts philanthropy. The other one is if you want to know what grant makers are thinking, much of grant makers in the arts content is public on their website, it's giaarts.org. Check me on that, Cheryl. Am I right on that? Yeah. Arts, yeah, dot org. And they have just published a statement on racial equity in grant making. Recognizing that doesn't cover the entire waterfront on diversity, but it was a powerfully important statement for the organization of grant makers in the arts to have made, and they have an ongoing racial and social justice work group that's, that's focusing grant makers' attention on that. Yeah, G I A R T S dot, I believe it's dot org. It is dot org. I have had confirmation from the field. Okay, so we're going over here, and then Faye has got the last word on this. We'll have a little song, and we'll hear from our fearless leader, Teresa. That's how it's going to play out. Tell us who you are. Hey, um, Nan Barnett from, wow, this is odd. I, yes, uh, welcome sorry. to the odd. <laughs> that plus my allergies, it's really really echoey in here. Um, I'm Nan Barnett from National New Play Network, and I just want to give a little shout out to TCG um, and take us back to where we began with the cohorts thing. I have the great privilege right now of working with what I believe are two of the most innovative, um, productive cohorts working in the national theater right now. I'm uh, at NNPN, where we are really changing how theater is shared and uh, created through the New Play Exchange and also, so of course, through our other programs like the Rolling World Premieres. Um, if you're not familiar with us, see what can happen when you put the, uh, 90 theaters that are all focusing on 
the same type of work, but it's in many different ways as possible uh, into a group. And the product has been pretty astounding and will continue to be. The other thing that I'm working on, and I saw, I know some of you were in uh, sessions with me, is that the Women's Voices Theater Festival, which is going to happen in DC this coming fall between September 8th and October 31st, there will be about 60 fully produced world premieres of plays by women happening in Washington, DC, in um, somewhere north of 55 different theater companies coming together to work on this project. Um, we're just getting ready to announce two industry weekends, the first weekend and the third weekend of October. You can come in and see anywhere from 20 to 30 uh, different pieces if you want, and you're really busy. Um, but there is such a great power in working together with other organizations that are not like you that I want us to remember always that that is really important. So take these things, these contacts you've made this weekend and remember to move those things forward because that's how in our world work gets done. Beautiful, thank you. Okay, last of our comments from the floor, please tell us who you are. My name is Faye Hargate. I am education associate at Cleveland Public Theater. And I just wanted to say human to human connection. We talk a lot about connecting with groups. Um, and when I think of this group and what I remember from the last three days is the people, the actual persons that I connected with. And I know if I have an authentic relationship with a person, that will validate my organization, myself, and that invitation to come to my organization because honesty and trust has been built and reciprocity through attending and through having a community and a relationship, then, then that human to human connection is, is the basis of desire and of the impulse of why we're coming from. And also active and honest curiosity. You know, it's not just to like check a box or to get the money. I mean, of course that's important because we all want to be thriving um, companies and we want livelihood inside of our theaters, of course, but if you as a person are actively curious about someone, one person, and build that relationship, that will have a multiplying effect, I believe, I've seen with the work at Cleveland Public Theater. Yeah, okay. <laughs> we end with Cleveland because we're gonna begin again with Cleveland in June. All right, this might take a second to get all our sound mix right, because we didn't have time to sound check this. Uh, many, many uh, excellent things were tweeted to hashtag banjo lyrics. You'll hear a few of those in this um, tiny little ditty to close us out. sure that you can hear me sing over the dang banjo. There we go. What a wonder Pastor Mike is energizing our fatigue. He has faith in all of us, y'all, so I'm willing to social justice. I believe in wild cards too, especially with moonshine. I believe in transformation. That's why I'm cohorting you. Oh, let's jam it up, shall we? Every day it's you and me again. Tweeting madly to our peeps. Ethics and aesthetics vex me as I watch my vision creep. Architecture of the culture needs more funding to come true. Cause my reckless imagination has to pay the light bill too. Oh, how I love that mighty Ethan, bringing big ideas to scale. Yep. Some better ways to fail. 
just and just and just and just and just and from the bonding on the buses to the wankers riding on the wall. Not you, really. No, you're not a wanker. Not a bit. <laughs> oh, what we learned in Kansas City should, will, we hope, revolutionize us all. Shake and bake creativity right there. Add hashtags and stir. So the last